Welcome to Coffee Commerce. My name is Sean Remett, and I'm the grandson of a coffee farmer from Guyana, South America. On Coffee Commerce, we don't only talk about coffee and business, but the ideas and the culture and the stories behind coffee that relate to coffee. We've been talking about the coffee house in Europe, and in our last episode, we talked about Pasquet Rosé, who opened up the first coffee house in London. And from there, how uh, his coffee house grew, tavern and the demand for taverns decreased in London, especially in the area near Cornhill. In 1658, we talked about Pasquet Rosé disappearing mysteriously, but we knew that the uh, tavern owners were conspiring against him. That would not be the end of uh, the coffee house, but it would be the, just the beginning. Coffee started to spread and the enjoyment for coffee became an acquired taste that would last in London for years to come. In 1663, just five years after Pasquet Rosé's disappearance, the number of coffee houses in London grew to 83. By 1700, there were as many as 2,000, some even say 3,000 coffee houses in the area as well. So coffee houses were becoming popular, very popular. At that time, coffee houses were also just for men. So it was not a place for a woman to go unless they were serving coffee. And this was more about the culture of the time in London than it was about anything, anything else. This will come into play in another episode in the future. In 1712, the nature of coffee houses starts to develop and to grow. It had already started to do so under Pasquet Rosé's Angel Coffee House, where, where men would come and gather and they would discuss ideas and news and, and some of the things that were going on around the world. But in 1712, a gentleman by the name of Joseph Addison opens up Button's Cafe. And it became a forum for a literary debate. In this coffee house, there was culture that started to be formed. For example, when you entered the coffee house, uh, they would ask, what news have you? Or your servant, sir, what news from Tripoli? And, uh, or in Latin, quid novi? It was not as fancy. Coffee houses in, in England were not as fancy as the ones in France or Vienna. They were wooden floors, wooden tables, wooden benches where, where the men would gather and drink, drink their coffee. But it was definitely a place of excitement. It almost became a public type of a venue. In, in this setting, though, as well, you also heard a lot of untruths. You heard make, made up stories because it became a popular thing to come and say, what news have you? And unless you had something that was meaningful to say, uh, you, you may not have gotten served. When you st told your story, you would sit down at the bench and a servant would bring you uh, a candle, a pipe, and your favorite drink of, of, of coffee. Unlike in today's coffee houses, all conversation was public. When you spoke, you did not speak just one-on-one -on -one to somebody, or you did not just come to enjoy a coffee uh, in, in isolation. It was a public place where you would listen to the conversation at the next table, or someone that was a complete stranger to you next to you, where you would sit and engage in a meaningful discussion. This was the nature of the coffee house. Unlike in coffee houses today, where you go and you have, you, it's more of a setting for private conversation. In England in the 1700s, it was a setting for public conversation. Out of the Buttons Coffee House came elements of the special Lions edition of the Guardian newspaper. And it was, it was from here that things such as news and rumors and uh, ideas started to take form in the Guardian newspaper. By the 1700s as well, there was a number of other things that were forming and transforming in coffee houses. But that's another story for another cup of coffee. Thank you. Mm -hmm.